Welcome to the Binge Breakers Podcast. I'm Jacqueline. I am here to teach you how I overcame bulimia and my binge eating disorder and how you can too. Through simple steps of mind management, repairing your relationship with yourself, understanding your habits, and intuitive eating. Disclaimer, this recording is not intended to be utilized as medical advice or a medical diagnosis. If you think you're in need of medical attention or treatment, please seek it immediately. This recording will also contain sensitive subjects such as binging and purging, weight and depression. Please listen at your own discretion and do what you think is best for you. Hello guys, welcome to the podcast. This is Jacqueline. And today we're going to be talking about mitigating damages and risks while you are struggling with bulimia. I've been wanting to do an episode like this for quite some time, but I have been hesitant because of the following. So I think it'd be helpful to put this disclaimer and kind of upfront thoughts and what's wrong with this episode up first. The reason I've been hesitant is because I don't want people to hear this and think I can just... I can just do these things, these simple tips and tricks and mitigate any damages that come with bulimia or any um, issues. And I can just keep on going for a while. That is not what this episode is. Even if you follow all the advice I give you in this episode, you will still probably suffer some sort of health consequences of bulimia. And even if you didn't, let's say for some reason, you're one of those odd people that don't exist that never have any sort of health consequence from like a physical health consequence from bulimia you will still have mental consequences from it and it will still take over your life. So I would just want to say this very clearly. There's no safe way to have bulimia in your life. There's no safe way to be binging and purging on a regular basis, to be restricting like that on a regular basis and purging by whatever means necessary, whether it's vomiting or um, whether it's exercising, none of it is safe. So this episode is to help you if you are suffering with bulimia, you're in recovery, you're trying to get out of it, but you are still currently binging and purging. This episode is meant to um, help you maybe mitigate and lower the risk you have of something like dental damage or physical damages that come along with bulimia, but there's not, there's no safe way to do it. You know, it's like, what are best, best practices if you're a smoker? Um, if you're a smoker, there's bound to be issues down the road, but you can probably do it in a way that would lower your risk. Before I go forward, I, I talked to a lot of people who they've had bulimia for a while, you know, maybe 15, 30 years sometimes. Um, I've definitely talked to people who've had it for longer, but the people I've worked with, um, the person that I worked with that had the longest amount of bulimia was 30 years. And they always tell me something similar. Like in my twenties, uh, it wasn't that bad. I was able to binge and purge as often as I wanted, sometimes a lot. And, um, I really got away with it. My body seemed to recover pretty quickly, but then once my thirties hit, it started to get harder and harder and harder to upkeep the bulimic habits that I had. And I hear that quite a bit. Uh, so for those of you guys that are younger listening, I know most of my audience is not just, you know, teens and 20 year olds, a lot of them are in their thirties and up. Um, so if you're older out there, you're not the only one, please trust me on that one. Uh, but if you're younger and you think I haven't, I don't experience that many symptoms, totally fine. It's not a big deal. You are wrong. Even if you don't know what's going on, if you don't see any symptoms, you will eventually get kickback from this terrible, um, eating disorder. It is not something to be messed with and you don't want it to get to the point where it's too bad. Fortunately, I did not struggle too much with health consequences of bulimia, though I only suffered for four years and only, I use that term lightly, I suffered with disordered eating for a lot longer than that. Also suffered with it, um, bulimia and anorexia in high school um, for a short amount of time. But it was in my early 20s, thankfully, and I think my body was pretty resilient. And even though I'm not suffering eating disorder more, I'm going to be 27 soon and uh, I can definitely sense the changes in my body already. Like my, I don't bounce back as quickly as I used to things catch up to you, especially as you age. And you don't want to wait till you're much older to try to deal with this. It's just not worth it. And your body, um, won't always be as resilient as it is. And even me saying I didn't suffer from any health consequences. I do think the enamel on my teeth, probably, uh, they're not, it's not as good as what it used to be. Probably. I definitely did some correct things, which I'm going to talk about that, lowered my risk of losing a bunch of, um, losing my teeth, you know, uh, I didn't suffer with that, but I definitely probably suffered with dental damage. I think my tongue also, um, suffered some, some losses there. And 
I definitely struggled, although it was never formally diagnosed with some ulcers uh, in my stomach, for sure. I feel like that's had to be what it is. And then I struggled, struggled with extreme IBS and probably lots of um, electrolyte imbalances and uh, mood swings and mental health things and depression, all that sort of stuff. So even though I came out basically scotch free, right? Scot free, uh, I still suffered a lot. So even you don't have to have extreme health consequences to um, want to get out of bulimia. Anyway, I hope I made that abundantly clear um, that even though these tips will help you, that isn't, it's not meant to say, please don't listen to this episode and think, oh, I can totally just binge and purge all day and no problems. Like that's not, that's not going to be the case. Sorry. It's just not. And even though um, if there were no health consequences, I still don't think bulimia is worth it because it becomes this addictive thing that only, that's the only thing you think about, the only thing that you care about. It's very numbing and it takes away your world mentally, even if you're physically totally fine. So keep that in mind too. Um, another thing I want to add about this episode, I always put a disclaimer in my intro, but since I'm going to be talking about some health related subjects and some things to do with your teeth and um, physical things, especially when we're talking about mitigating health damages, I want to make it clear I'm not a doctor. Um, so if you're experiencing some of these health things I'm, I'm I'm describing, please check with your doctor on what they would recommend. These are just tools and tips that I know can help, but your body is uniquely yours and you should talk to a medical professional if you experience any of these symptoms or you think that you may, or you're not sure what to do, always converse with them first. But before we start the episode, I just want to make a quick little interjection. I have some exciting news. I have a bulimia recovery course that I offer to all my clients and just people that are looking for a budget-friendly option to recover. And I know not everyone can afford coaching, but I, I wanted, when I first started coaching, I wanted a resource I could give to clients and people who maybe couldn't afford coaching to recover, to have the information and tools they needed when they weren't talking to me directly or they were doing their own thing. So I created the course. And since then, it's been evolving and changing and growing with my clients and what I learn. And now, after two years, I'm doing some changes to that course. But the first change that I'm rolling out with is that I'm, I'm adding something called monthly workshops. And that will be um, a monthly theme going on in the course that will help add on to uh, your recovery process. So for example, this month, what we're doing in March is we're focusing on future selves and who that would be and how we can become them. Because a lot of people struggling in recovery, they don't understand how they could even become someone who forgets that they have brownies in the fridge or forgets that they have chips in the cupboard or eats a piece of pizza and just a piece of pizza without losing their mind. They don't understand how they could be someone who isn't bulimic. What do they do with all that time? What are they, what, what's going on? They just sit there and they don't do anything else. There's so many questions and getting to know your future self can be really helpful for you. Then fitting into that role makes recovery easier, makes um, the unfamiliarness of growing, leaving bulimia a lot less scary. So that's a work we'll be doing this month. And then every single month, it will change. It'll add on something new. There's always already a wealth of information in the resource vault of the course, but then we're also doing these live workshops every single month. It's going to help, um, help people in the course continue their uh, journey, wherever they are, whether they're already recovered and they're in the course or they are just starting out. And I'm also changing up the pricing style because I obviously do one-to-one -one coaching, but because that's a lot of my time and I want to dedicate time to each client being with as much brain power and giving them the proper attention they deserve, that's a lot higher in cost. And I know that not everyone is in the position to afford that. I could barely afford the coaching that I paid for when I first started Bulimia Recovery. I did it because I knew it would change my life and I knew the investment was worth it. And I knew that if it didn't work out, I guess I just was still broke, but I, I did commit to that, but I know that, you know, not everyone can do that. And even me, I probably shouldn't have been doing that, but it worked out in the end for me. So I'm changing the cost of the course to just $49 a month. And I'm hoping that that is affordable to most of you and you can cancel at any time. Plus if you join the course and you absolutely freaking hate it. You think I'm the worst person ever. And you're like, this is disgusting. Even though I don't think that you will. 
you can ask for a refund within the first seven days. So it's really risk-free for anyone who wants to join. And I'm hoping that this will make it so much more accessible and give people no reason just to try it. Because I think that's one of the biggest barriers in recovery is like, I don't know if I actually like, there's a lot of risk. That's, that's the objection I get a lot with coaching is what if it doesn't work? Something like this, there's literally zero risk. You can try it. It will be okay. And if you hate it, you can just get out. But I always say, you know, it's worth the try because it could really change your life. That coaching program I joined changed my life forever. And I'm so glad that I took that risk, even though I really didn't know. So anyway, I'm changing that of course. And then over the year, I'll also probably be updating some things in the course, but there's so many good stories that come out of there. And you'll see if you go to the link I have in my description below, you'll definitely see a lot of the case study or the, all the stories that are coming out of that, but it's changing people's lives. So hope you'll consider it. Look out for that on Monday on my Instagram, there'll be an updated link and you'll be able to join and be one of the first kind of new members under this and be hit the course on the ground running with this new content that's coming out. So hope you guys like it. Okay. on to the episode. Okay, now let's move on to helpful things that you may not be doing, or you may be doing something that's actually causing more damage than necessary with bulimia. So I'm going to start with the most obvious one because um, most people ask me about it. I've been, again, avoiding the topic for a while because I'm like, oh, I'm not an expert on that. I don't know. But I want to offer you the best thing I can do. And I also hear clients a lot. I talk to people every day, right? And they'll tell me things that I know that they're doing that are actually worsening their teeth damage. And I always tell my clients like, Hey, don't, don't do that. Try doing this instead. And like, I never knew that. So I'm going to try to give that advice to you here. The most common thing people talk to me about or ask me about when it comes to damages is teeth damage, tooth decay, or tooth, your teeth just being compromised. And it's mainly due to the enamel. As you know, um, when you are purging via vomiting, uh, that's a lot of acidity. Your stomach acidity acid, or acid level, I think is um, the same level of battery acid. Like it's crazy um, the acidity in your stomach, right? To break down all that food, having it come back up um, after long, prolonged periods of time, especially if you're vomiting every single day, even just once a week is too much to be doing that, right? It's over time, it's going to completely wear away that enam- enamel. Um, and that's why people suffer with tooth or teeth problems, <laughs> having trouble with the plural, um, teeth problems later on in bulimia or pretty quickly. Some things that people don't realize that they're doing is wrong um, is a lot of people will brush their teeth directly after binging and purging. Um, or sometimes they'll brush their teeth directly after eating to try to uh, stop themselves from eating more food because that minty flavor is kind of a deterrent. And the reason people brush their teeth directly after purging is because they think, there's tons of acid in my mouth. I need to get it out of my mouth so that it doesn't break down my teeth. It's with good intentions, but it's actually backwards. Um, The problem is that when you are, are brushing your teeth directly after purging, your enamel is at its weakest, most vulnerable state. And that acid is going to soften it up a little bit. And then if you're brushing your teeth directly after that, you're actually wearing down the enamel much more than you would have had you just rinsed your mouth with water or um, yeah, just with water or uh, alcohol-free mouthwash. Uh, And same, same thing with eating food. People don't know this, but after you eat food, you're not a binge, not purging, just after you eat any food, after you drink, take a drink of water or take a drink of coffee or maybe some pop. I'm from the Midwest. I say pop, but soda, some sort of beverage that isn't water, your mouth, your pH level in your mouth is actually going to be um, pretty acidic. And so again, your enamel is at a softened uh, state. It's at a more compromised state and brushing your teeth directly after is the worst thing you can do because then you're just wearing away that enamel. And people don't realize this, but Electric toothbrushes are actually a better toothbrush to have um, versus one that's just a manual toothbrush, because with electric toothbrushes, you can just sit with a toothbrush and hold it and let the toothbrush gently scrub away the teeth. You actually don't want to be aggressively brushing your teeth. That is doing way more damage than you want to be doing. Um, And it's scrubbing away that enamel. You want to be 
very gentle with it. You don't need a whole lot of friction to get that plaque off. A lot of people, I used to be like this, um, even after I was bulimic, I'd like scrub when I brush my teeth, like I get in there <laughs> aggressively scrub it. You don't want to be doing that. I have an electric toothbrush now, and you're actually just supposed to hold it up to your teeth, put enough, put some pressure on it, but not too much and let the electric bristles motions do their thing. The vibration do your thing. You don't need much more than that. More than that is actually damaging and counterproductive for your enamel and your teeth. But dentists will always recommend if you go to the dentist, they'll tell you, brush your teeth before breakfast, brush your teeth before you have your morning coffee, brush your teeth before you put anything in your mouth in the morning, because they know that that's the safest time to brush your teeth and clean your teeth off as when you haven't had any food in your mouth and your enamel and mouth aren't compromised. But people are like, oh, well, it tastes weird if I have it before, but that is the safest time to do it. Um, so the same rules apply after binging and purging or after you've just ate, it's the worst time. The best thing you can do, let's say if you just had some food and you're really trying to avoid a binge, you're trying to deter yourself from eating more food instead of brushing your teeth, rinse out your mouth with water. And then you, you can even go for rinsing out your mouth with water and then, um, an alcohol-free mouthwash, or you can try something like gum. Although some people don't like that because it's continuing the chewing thing and people can have gum addictions too. I'm not a personal big fan of gum. I can't, I chewed so much gum in my bulimia days, like packs and packs a day. So sometimes occasionally I have some gum, but it usually makes me kind of nauseous now. I can't do gum very often, at least not for very long. So you could try to using a mint, something like a, a, I don't even know if they still have these, I bet they do like the Listerine strips, putting those on your tongue that will give you that minty mouthwash fresh feeling and make food taste gross or worse. That can be a deterrent, but do not brush your teeth right after you eat. And certainly do not brush your teeth right after you purge. It's like a huge no, no, or right after you binge, don't do that. Um, please just at least rinse it out with water and then maybe alcohol-free mouthwash and wait at least an hour um, till you brush your teeth for real. And don't forget after you have purged, um, especially to gargle with the water and the mouthwash, you don't realize it, but your throat um, has, it's not used to having stomach acid in it as well. And also um, depending on what you're purging, uh, this is getting kind of graphic. So if this is too triggering for you, please click off the episode. But sometimes when you are purging, I know I personally would choose foods that were the easiest to come back up. Uh, I would not dabble with crunchy things as much or things like that. But if you are dabbling in that, and I have too, that can kind of be pretty rough coming back up, especially when you're binging, you're not chewing the food sometimes properly. You're trying to get in really fast. At least that was the case for me. And so vomiting those things back up was really awful experience. My throat would be super raw. That's because the food's traveling back up combined with the stomach acid. It's not good. So gargling, while you're not going to gargle all the way down your throat and esophagus, you are going to um, get a little bit of the stuff back there and hopefully help that out a little bit. So don't forget to gargle um, with, with alcohol-free mouthwash or, um, or some just plain water. If anything, just do water. If you don't have access to anything else that will do wonders and it's not too damaging or anything like that. And that's the thing too, with this one, I felt really guilty about this tip, like sharing it with you guys. Cause I'm like, Oh, am I making it easier? But even if you do all these things, you're still going to have damages from the stomach and the throat and maybe damages in the mouth still. Um, even if you do the mouthwash right after I luckily, I knew for some reason I knew when I was bulimic that I wasn't supposed to, I think I looked it up. Um, I was, wasn't supposed to brush my teeth directly after, but I always rinsed out with mouthwash. Fortunately, unfortunately it had alcohol in it. Um, so I didn't know that, but I didn't know as much to, um, not brush my teeth directly afterwards. And I always washed it out with water or mouthwash. Okay. One of the second, one of the things that makes bulimia actually one of the most dangerous things ever isn't, um, I think the mental health aspect of it's very dangerous because it's very common when you were struggling with bulimia, it's also me struggling with depression and suicidal thoughts and things like that. At least that's what it was for me. Um, you're also at a risk of, you know, eating too much and bursting or, or ripping your esophagus or stomach. That's very dangerous, of course. But one of the more common reasons that bulimia is more dangerous is because of electrolyte deficiencies and people can actually suffer from heart attacks because their uh, potassium is really off. Their other electrolytes are really off and that can cause major imbalance and your heart to not work very properly. 
And you may not have a heart attack, but there's also um, other symptoms that are just that not just as severe and annoying, obviously heart attacks, not very good, but there are other things that can come from having electrolyte imbalances. Um, a lot of them, are, a lot of them are headaches, confusion, dizziness, nausea, fatigue, uh, muscle spasms, muscle twitching. That's a really obvious sign that a lot of people have that they've, they've got some deficiencies going on that they just ignore. Um, there's a regular heartbeat arrhythmia. That's that heart attack sort of, um, symptom warning that I was talking about. And then severe things would be something like a seizure or a coma, um, that sort of stuff. But I remember when I was going through bulimia, I still will sometimes have that. That means I'm not getting enough electrolytes, right? And um, balance is there. But what was really obvious when I was going through bulimia is I had muscle spasms up the wazoo. I just always, especially after working out, my muscle spasms would be really severe. I remember sitting one time down after a workout and my calf muscle was just like shaking to no end and like twitching and all that sort of crazy stuff. So not good. And I just thought like, oh, it's because I'm tired. And it probably was because I was tired, but also it's because there were some really um, significant electrolyte imbalances. But people think it's just potassium. That's the big one. And that is a big one, of course. Electrolytes, um, it's really important for maintaining and regulating certain very primary functions in your body and like balancing water levels, um, move nutrients into cells, remove waste products, allow nerves to send signals, enable muscles to relax and contract effectively, which is why my muscles would sometimes be really out of whack when I was going through bulimia and maintain brain and heart function, right? To actually have a functional brain um, and maintaining healthy circulation, all that sort of stuff and your body pumping, um, your heart pumping blood effectively um, and having those electric signals go correctly. But people think it's just potassium and there's actually many electrolytes, many minerals that are super important and vital to your body. And those include sodium, calcium, magnesium, phosphate, chloride, and bicarbonate. So all of those are really important. Now, what can you do? Like, how can you mitigate that risk? How can you try to keep things good? Well, the first most obvious thing is like, stop vomiting, stop excessively working out, stop taking laxatives. But if you're recovering, hopefully you're reducing the frequency in that because that's the most important thing for that. But let's say you just binged and purged or you're still struggling quite a bit. What can you do to help this out? Well, the best answer is to try to um, incur electrolyte rich drinks and foods in your uh, current diet. And especially after you binge and purge. Now I used to, my routine was when I was struggling with bulimia, this is, I'm laughing about it, but it's, it's actually was quite messed up of course, but I used to, um, I knew that electrolyte imbalances were a thing. I knew that I should probably try to mitigate those risks as much as possible. I was pretty health conscious. So smartly enough, I did grab an electrolyte, electrolyte heavy drink after binging and purging. And actually most of the time I would just grab it in the store along with the stuff that I was buying for my binge is I would grab, um, a Powerade zero blue flavor, which this is not a sponsorship, but it's not a promotion. This is what I would drink. I do not know if that actually was that important or significant and helping me because I don't know like what electrolytes are in there and what, um, whether there was that like significant and whether it was beneficial. I just knew that I liked the drink. I always used to drink it in volleyball in high school. And I knew that it promoted having electrolytes and was supposed to help athletes with their electrolyte imbalances when they're sweating all the time. So that's what I would grab. Um, again, don't know if it actually is that useful, but the idea was correct. It was like, okay, let's get this because after, after I binge and purge, I'm going to need this. So after I would binge and purge and I would rinse my mouth out with mouthwash or water, I would then start drinking the Powerade. I would also take um, an ibuprofen, but I would not recommend that because that can be kind of harsh on your stomach. So I'd try to not take any sort of medicine like that for a little while afterwards. Again, I'm not a doctor. Please speak with your physician about these things, but um, that probably wasn't the smartest, probably contributed to some stomach ulcer issues. But what I did do that was correct was having the Powerade or some sort of electrolyte heavy drink. Um, and so what I'd recommend, obviously Powerade isn't your only option. And I don't even know that's a United States thing. I don't know if they sell them abroad, but you can just try to choose foods or drinks that are, there are probably many drinks that are on the market right now, little pre-packaged bottles that are advertised being electrolyte uh, diverse. 
get one of those, or you could try just eating something like soups can be helpful because they have usually a lot of different nutrients in it and they can feel warm and comforting, especially for your throat after that. So maybe having like a hot, a hot soup, um, that's prepackaged or just available things that are, um, pretty usually electrolyte heavy. It's, it's a diverse thing since there's so many different electrolytes, but I'm going to run through a short list here that I have on the side. There's, you know, you can try something like spinach, kale, avocados, bananas, broccoli, potatoes, beans, peanuts, tofu, strawberries, watermelon, oranges, <laughs> tomatoes, um, some sort of protein, like olives, canned foods, so the list is wrong. I just would try to pick something that maybe has some salt in it, some potassium in it, some calcium. Soups are probably going to be your best bet because they tend to have a lot of different nutrients, different chopped up little foods. Like they've got everything from carrots, like a chicken noodle soup might be helpful. Or if you're vegan, try a vegan version or something like that. But I think a soup is your best bet or at the bare minimum, having some sort of electrolyte drink that's prepackaged at the grocery store that you can just pick up. Um, try that. That's what I would do. But that can be really helpful for trying to keep your electrolytes at least like not dangerously out of whack. Again, the best way to reduce that risk is just to stop binging and purging or reduce that as much as possible. But if you're struggling with that right now, try to do that at the bare minimum. Okay. This is not necessarily something that is reducing damages, but it's a mistake that I see so many people make in bulimia recovery. And I just think it's the best thing to do, best practices to do after you binge and purge. Do not starve yourself. Do not try to make up for it. And if anything, try to eat as soon as you feel even slightly hungry. Um, I used to think like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try not to eat after this. I'm going to try to make up for it, but that puts you right back in the binge purge cycle. It puts you in the habit of restriction. I can't eat. I'm going to delay food. I'm hungry, hungry, hungry. And then you kind of feel scarcity with food. And then that's opening more opportunities and more excuses to binge because you haven't eaten for the past 24 hours, haven't eaten that for the past six hours. So might as well just binge and purge again. It's really, really helpful to keep, get right back into a regular um, diet as soon as possible after binging and purging, because that restriction plays a huge role in keeping you in the cycle. And I know it sounds scary when you are struggling with binging and purging, because you're like, I binge and purge all the time, Jacqueline, this like I can't eat because I don't feel safe eating. You got to start somewhere and not eating all the time. is not helping you clearly. So try something different. Regular meals and nutrition is super important and trying to have those meals be balanced. Of course, have whatever junk food you want, have whatever unhealthy or, you know, foods that are something that you really think is tasty, but not super good for you. But I would recommend adding in some healthy foods as well. Foods that make you feel satisfied and good, such as like be a meal with some vegetables, protein, fat, and carb sources all in one and some whole grains and some, some, um, plant-based fats or something like that. Some avocado, some, um, olive oil, something along those lines. Um, whether you are plant-based like, uh, and you have tofu or some sort of, uh, bean dish, or you're, um, you don't mind eating meat, have some fish or some chicken or something like that. Try and include those things in your diet. And then something to help reduce, damages mentally or um, something to help kind of keep you a little bit sane during this process is to look out for support. And I'm not just saying go and work with someone that's very important to you, but try to find someone to talk to. It's just talking with a client who she was about to binge and purge, but then she made the smart move and she actually went and talked to her dad and said, I'm feeling really stressed. I'm feeling like I want to eat. Um, can we talk? Like, I don't, I don't know what to do. And they actually went on a walk together. And of course I know that not everyone has that support in their life. She was very fortunate in order to do that, but it still took her guts to go out and reach out to him about that. Um, for you try having a friend you can call, try having some sort of support somewhere, maybe a Facebook group you can post in something that's going to be super important for getting you out of that spiral. I know one of the biggest contributors to kind of keeping me in that cycle bulimia and then therefore keeping the damages going was isolation. The times where my eating disorder thrived was when I was isolated alone and didn't feel like I had anything else. In college, even before the bulimia started, there were so many weird things I was doing with food that I didn't really realize it was that weird because no one was around to tell me that different. And also it kept me busy. And so I didn't really crave any social interaction. I didn't go out for social interaction. My um, kind of pastime when I wasn't in school was my eating disorder. And I knew enough to know that I shouldn't, some of those things, like I shouldn't mention to people, that's what I do with my time. But at the same time, 
I didn't really know the severity of it. And I think looking back, many people would have been concerned and they would have tried to tell me something and they probably would have tried to talk me through it. And maybe they would have gotten through to me. Maybe it would have been helpful to gain that perspective. Um, So if you are struggling with the eating disorder, on top of all these physical things you can do to mitigate those damages, really, really try to find someone, at least one person that you can lean on for a little bit during your support. Um, Even if it's an online support group or it's an in-person friend, it depends on what your level of comfort is and who you're around um, and what, what type of people you have available. But social interaction, support from others, very, very important. And then also constantly listening to uplifting things, not just um, for your mental health. Something that really causes you to stay in the spiral of dulimia is what you consume online and what you're constantly listening to, seeing social media. It's a great thing. It's a great place for you to, for amazing messages to be found. The eating disorder community on Instagram is just amazing. There's also a lot of things that are very toxic on public platforms. And so be careful about what you're consuming. If you're always looking at Instagram models, right? And influencers, and they're always spewing like the next diet and um, showing off their body. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying that maybe it's not the healthiest thing for you to be looking at right now. Maybe you need to take a bit of balance of that and try to put more things in place in your social media and the podcast you listen to and the shows that you watch that are more uplifting. You can't control what's out there, but you can control what you listen to and what you see. And so I'd recommend that for reducing mental damages there, reducing the risk of you staying in bulimia and giving you more hope and inspiration so you can get out of it. So you can get more mentally there and fit and helpful. Okay, that's the episode I have for you guys. I hope that this doesn't spark much controversy, but at the end of the day, I'd rather you do it um, with as much risk lowered as possible. Again, there's no safe way to have bulimia in your life, but this will definitely help you not make some awful mistakes that some people make that progresses things much faster than it needs to be. Um, there's, there's no safe way to do it, but I am glad I knew these things during it. I also suffered for a shorter amount of time than some people. So that probably helped me not have as many risks, but yeah. Um, the other symptoms along with bulimia, just take time to heal. Like, Uh, Those things, I don't necessarily have any other good advice for you other than to stop binging and purging and try to get onto intuitive eating and try to have a regular diet and and eating routine. But when it comes to face swelling, um, when it comes to bloating and IBS, I always talk about this in my course and with my clients, but it took my digestion about a full year to completely recover. Now, it wasn't like I was awful and then one day it just poof gone. It just was a slow process of getting a little bit better, a little bit better, like a little less gassy, a little less um, inflamed um, and a little less irritated. And eventually I'd say it's pretty normal most of the time. Something that's also been helping me out recently um, is just having a, a meal prep or a meal service delivered. And I'm not even talking about a meal prep service where they give you the ingredients and you cook it. I'm just getting um, delivered meals to my house. Like we, I get about seven or 10 delivered to me. So I still make some of my food, but some of them are just prepackaged and that's been helping me out so much just to not worry about it. So one other thing I might say to help you with bulimia is if you really struggle to eat food and um, have food in the house or um, understand what to do with food, maybe considering a meal prep service. I know not everyone has the financial means to do that, but it really takes all the guesswork and thinking out of it and saves you a lot of time. So you don't have to constantly be thinking about that and wondering. So that's another thing that's helped me, but regular meals is um, and stopping binging and purging will help reduce a lot of those other things like the face falling, the bloating, the IBS, the slow digestion, that sort of stuff. That that stuff just takes time and the best thing you can do for it is recover and you'll be a lot better off and your metabolism will be healing after that too, which is another thing we didn't even talk about, but regular food, exercise and movement. I know binging and purging is going to help tremendously with all those things. So hopefully that's even more motivation for you to recover. Okay. I'm going to let you guys go. I hope you guys have something planned this weekend that you enjoy, even if it's just like a 10 minute breather away from all the chaos. Okay. Never give up on yourselves, my friend. Thank you for listening. Bye.